It's been nearly nine years since the fall of the Taliban, but violence against women in Afghanistan is still widespread. The lives of women were in danger all the time, at any time they could be a victim of sexual abuse. For the sake of God, please help me and my children. She says she was tired of waiting for her husband to come back from his big job each night. And so quietly, carefully, she carved out an important and sensitive role for herself. women to feel good about themselves, to take an active role in society, and for that they need to be respected. You can see anything. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just the two of us. Madam First Lady, it's a treat to be here with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming all the way from Afghanistan to join the Women in the World Conference. I know you have to spend a, a lot of your time dispelling myths about Afghanistan, and I thought we'd begin by giving you a chance to hit a few of them out of the park right here. Um, what are the biggest challenges you have in explaining your country and its reality today? And then we'll talk particularly about women. Uh, the challenge is not really to explain. Uh, the challenge is uh, to read in the media of the Western uh, uh, publications that uh, uh, Afghanistan is about to fail, uh, Afghanistan is uh, economically um, uh, completely collapsing, uh, that uh, uh, the Taliban are winning, uh, the, uh, that, uh, you know, all these things that you're reading and you're thinking, my God, the country has gone to the dogs, that's it. And actually, um, I don't think that's true. And I don't really know why people say all this. They probably have their own, uh, their own reasons to create a, uh, an atmosphere of insecurity in Afghanistan. But uh, uh, for the past 18 months, um, there has been a lot of improvements and uh, there has been uh, a lot of work done. Of course, it was much more uh, infrastructure work, so it does not show. Mm -hmm. Don't really see it. And uh, I'm really hoping that uh, in a few months or in a year, you start seeing improvement in Afghanistan. So if I want you to leave here with an idea is that Afghanistan is not as bad as the press makes it. Everyone but the New York Times, I'm sure. Um, uh, <laughs> let's talk about the role of women in particular. Your, your husband's been in office, been president for 18 months mm -hmm. now. What improvements um, you know, are you most proud of in terms of the role of women and their opportunities in Afghanistan today? Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of my husband because uh, I, I will not take credit for the uh, improvements of the women that he has brought. And, uh, you know, we uh, already have a certain quota of women in the parliament. We have 67 women that are deputies, or congresswomen, you would say here. Uh, we have uh, now, uh, thanks to my husband, four women ministers. Uh, we have, uh, he appointed two women as governors. Only one is still a governor, the other one had to uh, resign. Uh, he appointed a woman to the Supreme Court, and um, she almost got it. Mm. Uh, she, she was short of six, six votes, which is too bad, but... Uh, a lot uh, of judges, though, too, didn't he? Uh, no, the judges are not appointed by I him, see. but there are... It's something, it's a, it's a detail that people don't really know. We have two, over 250 women that are judges in Afghanistan. So it's not like uh, um, it's a total uh, desert in the justice system. And actually, uh, let me take this opportunity to say that the justice system is undergoing a reform. You know, basically, we've had 23 years of war, civil war, conflicts, uh, occupation, 
Then it was followed by the 14 years of the previous regime, which uh, brought some stability, but the violence still prevailed. We still have uh, warlords, we still have people who have militias, which means that people uh, have recourse to violence much more than to the rule of law. And the judicial was rather corrupt. Uh, we have a new uh, head of the Supreme Court, who within two days had already uh, uh, made two decisions that really uh, leveled the field. He decided that uh, 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 the, Supreme, uh, the head of the Supreme Court will not be able to uh, um, uh, reverse a decision of the uh, Supreme Court itself and that uh, any other decision uh, during uh, the court uh, process uh, on uh, um, financial, uh, financial uh, punishments, or you call it some judgments, um, uh, could not be reversed by the head of the Supreme Court. So you realize how much corruption there was. He was, I mean, the previous one must have really collected a lot of money before mm -hmm. that. Right now, you can't do that anymore. Terrific. And, uh, uh, well, there are a lot, a lot of other things for women. Um, Let me ask you a question about your okay. husband, if I could. Uh, sure. uh, one of your family friends was quoted as saying in the New York Times that your husband, greatly influenced by his grandmother, yes. was the first to say respect a woman as a woman, not as a mother, sister, or a wife. Would, would you call your husband an Afghan feminist? <laughs> You, you all think it's a contradiction in terms. <laughs> uh, well, let me tell you something. Afghanistan is a normal country, and like in any country, there are chauvinists and there are regular men. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 my husband, indeed, uh, was very close to his grandmother, and she was... Um, she had been uh, in, a, I mean, the family had been in political exile in Lahore, and in Lahore she had gone to school, and when she came back, she made sure that her six sons and her daughter uh, got all um, higher education, they all went to university, and uh, she made sure that her grandchildren too, and so uh, my husband remembers that. Uh, she, uh, I would, say, I would say that, you know, there is another thing I would like to mention. Another myth is that men don't care about women in Afghanistan. Let me give you the example of a hotline. There is a hotline at the Ministry of uh, Women's Affairs that's called 6464, which is supposedly for um, uh, resolving family issues. 70% of the people who call are men their fathers, their brothers, their sons, their nephews, who are worried for a woman relative. And they will call, they'll initiate the call, they'll start talking, uh, then once they find that, okay, this seems like a good place, they put the woman on. So it shows the care, it shows that men really care about women. As I said, we have of every, every kind. You and I both lived in, in Lebanon in the 70s. Yeah. Um, you lived in Afghanistan then too. You came to America for graduate school at Columbia, was it? Or, um... uh, yes, I had done already graduate school at AUB. I, uh -huh. I kind of collected MAs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to put up a picture of Afghanistan, um, uh, the Afghanistan you knew in the 70s, because yeah. after you left then, you really couldn't go back until 2002, but that, that's a picture. Of, uh, of women yes. in your country back in the 70s. What happened? Uh, That's not a picture you'd no, expect to see is, today. No, this, is, this was normal. My, uh, one of these ladies could have been my mother-in-law. Uh, it's... Um, what happened between that picture and 2000? War and happened. And this is something that people should understand. It's maybe more difficult for people who are living in the United States, where you have not uh, uh, witnessed war and its destruction on your soil. Uh, war destroys, and destruction is quick. 
It happens in a minute, you know, one bomb and a whole building is gone. Then to re rebuild that building will take years. Uh, war destroys society. War destroys the fabric of society, dislocates families. Uh, there is no more right or wrong. During a time of war, you don't live, you survive. You try, you are in a survival mode and you do sometimes horrible things you never thought you would do. So the state of war is really a horrible thing. I, I beg of anyone in the audience who might become a leader at some point and would want, would be faced by a possibility of going to war, please think through. War does not resolve anything. We've had 17 war, years of war in, Af uh, in Lebanon, and when I go back, it's as if there hadn't, nothing has been resolved, the same problems are still there. In Afghanistan, it's a little bit different because the destruction has been really much more uh, larger. And basically, we need to rebuild society. But why did, why did women take the brunt of it in terms of their freedoms, um, uh, their ability to circulate, their ability to get educated. Um, that, that's, that picture was of, a, was of a very different cultural okay. society. Yeah. What happened? Uh, well, um, a lot of people left the country and uh, there are uh, very large communities of Afghans. In the States, I think it's a quarter million people. Mm -hmm. There are in Europe too, in Germany, in Holland. Uh, in many more places. I think the middle class left, mm. and uh, uh, the people who stayed uh, did not really have anything to hold on to. Uh, so went back to religion? And uh, uh, in that vacuum, it's not a going back to religion, it's much more, I don't call uh, the uh, the uh, uh, so-called religious, the alleged religious movements, uh, uh, religious, they're more, more like cults, you know? They are cults. Uh, I happen to be uh, fluent in Arabic, it's my mother tongue, I read the Quran, and uh, uh, I have trouble finding where they get their inspiration in the Quran from. Mm. It's not what they're saying. Uh, and uh, in my speeches, I try to uh, use quotes from the Quran, uh, so that people realize that, uh, you know, what is being said is not necessarily uh, uh, the correct uh, Islam. Besides, Afghanistan is 99.9% .9 Muslim, so people are very comfortable in their religion. They, they were Muslims, they are Muslims, they will remain Muslim. They don't need anybody to come and teach them Islam. So um, I feel that, uh, I don't know why we came onto religious here, but I mean, what has happened, it was a, uh, a really a movement from people who came from outside. You have to remember the Taliban were Afghans, but they grew up in the camps of uh, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a bureaucratic decision said that uh, the camps should not have schools. So there were no regular schools in the camps in Pakistan, but madrasas were allowed. So people send their children to madrasas, and the brightest of these children were taken to seminaries, age eight, age nine. No wonder they don't know women. I mean, they, uh, they have not lived with women, and so when they hmm. came back to Afghanistan, they had this very insecure attitude towards women and started uh, um, imposing the Diobandi thing, this, which is very close to the Wahhabi thing. So um, it's a... Uh, it's One a thing led to another. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've been compared to Queen Soraya, um, who was a first lady in the 20s, yeah. who played a very public and progressive role uh, in her day. What's it like to be First Lady of Afghanistan? What's a typical day like for you, a typical week? How do you engage with the public? First, let me say very humbly that I'm not Queen Soraya, <laughs> <laughs> okay? I'm just, I happen to be the wife of the president, so 
I happened to be on the grounds uh, in the palace and... Uh, Tell I us about where you live in the palace in Kabul. Yeah. Yes, and uh, I happen to have uh, grown-up children in their 30s, so they don't need me anymore. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I have a lot of time on my hands mm -hmm. and... Uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I could not uh, sit idle. I had to do something. And uh, my husband said, well, you can always open an office. And I opened an office and thought maybe one or two people will come by and, uh, you know, come and have tea with me or something. <laughs> and then there was this deluge of women, groups of women and men who came to see me. First of all, I was the new kid on the block. They needed to come and kind of check me out. Mm -hmm. Who am I and what am I doing? And, but then slowly, because I love sitting and talking with people, they started to open up about their problems, their complaints. Um, what would the men ask about? The men, uh, I had a group of uh, people from Hoare, which is a central, uh, a very um, uh, isolated uh, province uh, in Afghanistan. And they came and they wanted uh, improvement to their uh, uh, standards of life. So they needed a, a road. They have a road that links them to Herat. And they wanted it paved so that they could reach that city very quickly. Uh, they said, we have, three, um, we have three rivers we'd like uh, for the government to generate electricity. That was totally acceptable for me. I said, I will convey their ideas. And the third idea, they said, well, we don't really have um, structures for school. Uh, in winter, the school is, uh, uh, is uh, held next to the wall that catches the sun. And in summer, it's next to the wall that catches the, that is in the shadow. And I looked at them. There were like 25 or 30 of them, strapping young men, in their early 20s, and I said, come on, you're kidding me. You could get together. One day, two days, three days, you can build a house of two rooms, and you can have a school. Why are you waiting for the government to do it? So, uh, yes, men, I, I, I jostle with everyone, even with men. <laughs> Did they come back again for more advice? <laughs> uh, they do come back. They do come back, uh, but they What about the women? What's the biggest thing that when the women who come to see you, what trends or patterns do you see in, in their requests, in their complaints, in, in the aspirations that they project? Uh, what I find out that if ever I talk long enough with them, they come up with the solutions. Interesting, themselves. Yes, yes, and this is something, again, if there are in the audience anybody that are working in development, take time to sit down with the local population. Take time to listen to them. They know their situation better than anyone else. So eventually, they come up with solutions, and I said, great, and if they don't come up, I say, no, go and think it through. You know your situation. I'm sitting here. I cannot tell what are all the elements of your situation. So please go and figure out. And if ever you come with a solution, know that I will protect you. I will push for you. I will encourage you. There was a particularly tragic story out of Afghanistan, um, the story of Farhunda, a woman falsely accused of uh, burning a Quran who was stoned and beaten, uh, set on fire by a mob of men. Um, justice wasn't really served. What, what should be our takeaway from that story today? It's extremely unfortunate that it happened. It was uh, heart-wrenching to see it. And I think all Afghans that have seen it, and fortunately now phones can take videos very quickly. So we saw it from all ang angles. And uh, people felt really ashamed at first. Uh, very upset. Women were, of course, uh, very, very upset. And uh, uh, there were a lot of protests, there were a lot of uh, manifestation. But what, I, what, come out, uh, what came out of it is that people were much more determined to stop the violence, to try and figure out where does this violence come? Why do we still have violence in our society? And how should we get rid of it? Uh, it's not going to happen in a day, one night and one day. But um, it will happen. 
And you will see, actually, I think in the video that was playing by the time we were uh, coming on the stage, you saw the women carrying the coffin of Farhunda. They were the pallbearers. Yes. They refused to let the men carry the coffin. Traditionally, the women don't even go to the cemetery. They refused, they carried it, they were like, I don't know, hmm. 15, 20 women carrying that coffin and took it to the cemetery. They really showed their determination, their anger, and then they really have been working since then to do things uh, in a different way. So there are already two results. One is that now we have a kind of fund for uh, women that are victims of violence. Uh, that is, uh, people can contribute to it and that will help any victim with medical and legal uh, expenses. And the second thing is that uh, women are starting to have conferences, I mean, they call them conferences, but uh, meetings, uh, general meetings, large meetings with mullahs and imams to try and discuss what does religion say about the treatment of women and what is the place of women in Islam. And I think this is extremely important and uh, I think it's, it's a very, very uh, good step because we need to get rid of all the, uh, how shall I say, uh, half-truths that are the norm well, these days. One of the things I find most exciting that you're working on that would actually contribute to that is a public university for women. Um, there are private universities in Afghanistan yes. for women, but a public university. Mm -hmm. where, where is that in terms of its establishment, and what impact do you think it can make? Uh, I think, for me, it's, uh, it's just common sense. In a country where uh, women, uh, especially in the provinces, are not freely allowed to go out of the house unless it is really uh, orchestrated and they're accompanied or something, there is no way for them to uh, carry on their education if there is not a university that is specializing for women. It's really, it's really very interesting that some social activists in Kabul were very worried that a university for women were, would isolate them and that uh, the women would, uh, would then uh, be on the margins of society. Uh, I think this is why I ended up being uh, accredited with the idea of the University of Women, because we had a discussion, a public one, and I kept saying, no, but these women are already isolated. They need that university. And for them, uh, the fear of isolation is, was much larger. They wanted women to, be, to, be, to feel comfortable, to, to be accustomed to sit in the same room with men and being able to discuss with them face to face. Um. Well, just to close, mm -hmm. I'm 62. I've been a foreign correspondent mm -hmm. for the New York Times for about 40 years. Will I ever get to cover a female president of Afghanistan? We've had female candidates to the presidency. It's That's not, uh, it has happened, so who knows? Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very really, much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs>